So the absolutely brutal season of 2024 has come to an end. The Reds unfortunately miss out on the playoffs because of just their all-time collapse in the month of August. Had a bit of September, but doesn't really matter because they still miss out by quite a bit. So let's just hop straight into the recap here of the season. Standings-wise in the National League East, you've got the Phillies, who easily won that division. 11 games back was the Braves. In the Central, you've got the, Cl the Cubs, who were 104-game winners. Cardinals won 86 games behind them. And then you had us finishing the year at 76 and 86, I believe, in fourth place in the division. And then in the National League West, there was the Dodgers, who were even more of a wagon than the Cubs were with 110 wins. And then the Padres behind them at 90 game winners. While the wild card game is the Padres hosting the St. Louis Cardinals. While the Braves miss out by 10 games and we end up missing out by a whole 10 games. Or the Braves miss out by 5 games, we miss out by 10 games. I believe I mixed that up, but you know what I meant. And then flipping things over to the American League side of things, in the East, you've got the Rays, who win the most mediocre division in baseball at 81 and 81 on the season. Yankees one game back, Jays and Sox both two games back, and then somehow in this division, the Orioles lose 100 games and are 22 games out of first place. Well, on the central side of things, you've got the Chicago White Sox, who won that division. Guardians and Tigers both be both over 500 on the season, but no playoffs for either of them. While in the West, it was a very solid division. You've got the Angels who won 102 games, the Astros with 96 wins, and then the Mariners with 88 wins. So that leads us into the wild card, where it's going to be the Astros hosting the Mariners. Guardians miss out by four games. And then take a look at what the playoff bracket looks like, the postseason bracket. We will check things back in with the postseason a little bit later in the video. But now it is time to dive into our team, the Reds here, see what happened, what uh, our players did on the season. And the first one up is J.D. Martinez, who finished the year with an 845 OPS. Finished the year on a cold streak as well. 27 home runs of the All-Star break, only finished with 35. So definitely a bit of a uh, rough second half for him. I do want to say that I think like through August, he only had one more home run. Like he hit a lot of those in September, I believe. And he did get hit pretty hard by regression, unfortunately. Still managed to put up really two solid years of numbers with the Reds here in 2024 and 2023. Played in all 162 games in both those seasons. Still a great year this year, too. Just unfortunate we couldn't get in the playoffs, at least for JD to finish probably what's going to be his career because I doubt anybody else signs him in the offseason. We won't be. Then there was Tyler Stevenson, who put up a pretty solid year, finished the year on a hot streak, 791 OPS, 20 home runs, 29 doubles, second highest war on the team at 5.1. Would love to see him continue to be hitting like that for us next season. Then there's Taylor Walls, who did fall off a bit in the second half. 745 OPS, 364 OBP, 25 doubles, 21 swiped bags. Still a good season, just not lighting the world on fire like he was in the first half. Highest war on the team with a 5.2. Got a big boost to his ratings as well, so still feeling very good about Taylor Walls as a player. You know, expecting him to have an OPS in the high 800s probably isn't realistic anyways. Well, Jonathan India is exactly a guy you expect to be hitting with an OPS into the 800s, but he never does that because he's very disappointing. A 7-3-4 a OPS this year, finished the season on a cold streak. He regressed in basically every single rating, if you look at his ratings. I mean, just what can you, what can you say? The guy's been bad. Aside from that one season he had in season one where he had uh, 35 home runs, but he wasn't getting on base. And then the next year he got on base a little bit more, but he wasn't hitting as many home runs. And then this year he does this. While Brian Anderson is another disappointing player, sub-700 OPS for him in the first year of a three-year deal. Hopefully he can rebound next season. Ellie De La Cruz finished with a 767 OPS, 14 home runs, 18 doubles, and 20 stolen bases. Not the best numbers, but still a solid number for a rookie. Probably above league average as well. I don't really have a way of looking at what league average is. But if I had to guess, 767 is probably above league average. Also had a very notable zero errors committed in 940 innings. Very solid defensive player, obviously. Big boost to his ratings across the board. Still only going to be 23 years old next season. Still lots to be excited about with Ellie De La Cruz. 
Well, Nick Senzel actually did put up a pretty solid season for us. Played center field every day uh, post the All-Star break and ended up with a 7.54 OPS, which once again is probably above league average, if not like right around the league average. 28 doubles, played a good defensive center field, nothing to complain about with him. Joe Adele, though, I will complain about because I'm starting to really think that he's never going to be good. 7.35 OPS. I just, looking at his ratings, I just don't think he's really ever going to be able to hit consistently. I was hoping that he'd be able to improve his plate skills more than he has in his time here, and that just hasn't been the case, unfortunately. But if you do want to look on the positive side of things, this was the year that he's had by far the most ABs in the big leagues, so who knows? Maybe he's stood just finally starting to get his feet wet here, and then next season he really starts to figure it out. Who knows what could happen, but as of right now, not feeling too hot about him. Well, Paven Smith, another guy, finished the season poorly, was great in the first half, awful in the second half. Definitely not enough for me to want to bring him back next season either. Austin Barnes also finished the year pretty poorly, and then Max Schrock, 115 ABs in the bigs for him. Didn't really show any flashes of what he did in the minor leagues this season, but because of what he did in the minor leagues this season, he got a major ratings boost, so he's a guy who's still very much on my radar. And then Kevin Kiermeyer, as we know, barely played this year, tore his MCL diving back into second base, and missed most of the season. And we will not be bringing him back next year either. So Kevin Kiermeyer's time with the Reds has come to an end, as well as probably Jake Bowers. Also just not good enough for me to want to bring him back. Uh, Nolan Jones, I mean, I just really, really hate where he's at in his career. Probably just a quad A, a quad a guy. Going to be in AAA, raking, comes up to the bigs, never does anything. And then Alan Serta is the guy who was raking all throughout the minor leagues. We brought up to the bigs, and he also didn't really do much in the big leagues. And then flip things over to the pitching side of things, there's John Means, who had a good season, but probably did not expect to miss the playoffs when he got traded to us from the Orioles. But I mean, also, we didn't expect to miss the playoffs like this either. But still, solid season for the left-hander John Means. And then moving things on to Tyler Malley. Really bad start to the year for him, but he did manage to get both his ERA and his FIP back down into the fours. So he probably had a pretty decent second half. There's no way to look at monthly stats in this game, because why would there be in a baseball game a way to look at monthly, by month stats? Look at what guys are doing in their past 10, 15 games. Why would anybody ever need that? But I am pretty confident that Malley will be better next season. He just had a bad down season. He'll hopefully be rebounding next year. Well, Hunter Green, solid year overall. Finished on a cold streak, but ratings-wise, really impressive for Hunter Green. He's becoming a really, really good pitcher. Still only going to be 25 next season. He'll be like 27 when he hits free agency, and I'm hoping I'm going to be able to re-sign him. I'm definitely going to be trying to re-sign him because I believe he has next year and then one more year left on the deal that we gave him. Well, similar thing with Nick Lodolo. Also been steadily improving. A little bit older than Hunter Green, but still only going to be 27 next season. And then there is Ryan Weathers, who the AI just loves using him in the sim. 125 and two-thirds innings as a bullpen arm, even while in the middle reliever spot, like all season long, because I don't like to put guys in long reliever roles, because the AI does that thing where it just says, like, oh, long reliever, let's just throw him as much as the starters do, and then give nobody else any innings. So I've been kind of experimenting with having just a bunch of middle relievers, two setup guys and a closer, and no long relievers. And the AI just kind of seems to do the same distribution for the relievers, but it just sort of picks whatever guy it, it thinks should be the long reliever. Well, there's also Alex Reyes, who had an absolutely wild season, both figuratively and literally, struck out a ton of guys, 11 or 114 Ks and only 88 innings pitched, 11 K per nine. But he also walked a ton of guys with an eight walks per nine. We're definitely trying to be avoiding guys like him uh, in, in years to come. I, I think he's still like a useful reliever because he strikes out a ton of guys. But I mean, if you're going to walk that many guys, you need to be striking at, like, just as many guys as he does. Then there's Lucas Sims, who definitely improved from his dreadful last season. 45 saves, very solid. Not that saves really mean much, but it's still a cool number to look at. Only a 3.9 walk per nine as well, so 
pretty solid there. TJ Antone had a very solid year as a setup man here in Cincinnati. So did Andrew Chafin as the righty-lefty combo in the setup spot. Well, Seth Elledge also very good. 11K per nine, four walk per nine. He's one of those guys that I'm not very good with in game. Like I can work ground ball outs with him, but I just can't get guys to swing and miss with him. And just as an off note, I hate looking at relievers specifically in this game for their stats because, I mean, the stats they give you in this game to look at players, like, those aren't stats that I ever look at if I'm, like, judging a reliever in OTP. Like, you will never see me looking at stats like ERA and FIP for a reliever. But they don't have stuff like ERA plus even in this game. And then a couple other pitchers. There is Brandon Williamson, who managed to put up decent numbers in the bigs this season. We did not actually send him down to AAA. I know right now it says that he's on the Louisville bats, but that's because for whatever reason in this game, at the end of the regular season, your organization just decides to, like, make players go to certain levels. So, like, guys who were in AAA for me will end up being in the big leagues to end the year, and then guys who were in the big leagues go back down to AAA. But it, like, never uses their options or anything. I don't, I don't know what it is. It's some weird, like, roster management bug thing that they don't sort out. Like, I believe last season, Alejo Lopez ended the year in the bigs for me, at least when you look at the stats, because he was never in the bigs for me last season. He just said that he had zero stats because... He was never in the big leagues, but for whatever reason, the uh, the show AI puts him on the big league roster, but then doesn't actually take away an option for anybody. So I guess at least they don't take away an option for guys. That would be pretty uh, game-breaking, I would say. And then there was also DeAndre Foster, who had a solid season for us in the bullpen. I really like his ability to limit walks. Didn't strike out as many guys as I would have thought, because he does have a good K per nine rating, but still pretty solid season from him his first year in the major leagues. And then there's Logan Allen, not great 12 starts in the bigs, and then Jarrett Ross, really poor eight starts for him. I mean, I don't know what to say about these guys. I've been posting franchises on MLB The Show since 2014, and I've been playing the show for even longer than that, and I have never, never, ever, ever had as much trouble as, the, as I do with this series as trying to get guys to make the jump from AAA to the big leagues. It is usually just a very cut and dry thing in MLB The Show. Like, it's a very easy thing, usually, to make a good roster in MLB The Show. But for whatever reason, in this series, it just seems like every guy that I call up is just like a total grind to even get them to be, like, semi-respectable. And then if we take a look at the team stats for the Reds, they had the 20th most runs scored with 664, and then the 20th most runs allowed with 716. So definitely not a, you don't want a negative run differential. Uh, the fourth most stolen bases, top five team. And that again, as you would expect, but only 21st in stolen base percentage. So getting caught a lot more than you would like to see. A lot of that probably has to do with, uh, like for example, J.D. Martinez, probably ended the year with something like nine stolen bases and like 13 caught stealing or something absurd like that because for whatever reason the AI decides to run literally anybody a bunch but they like they'll run JD Martinez the same amount that like Taylor Walls will run but Taylor Walls will be uh more successful so he gets like 20 stolen bases while JD Martinez gets caught like 15 times I would prefer they just don't run JD Martinez but once again, not something you can really control unless you go in and quick manage every single game. And even then, there's a whole different plethora of issues that pop up once you start doing that, like scripted games and shit like that. But anyways, fielding percentage was a good thing for this team, though. As we try to do with defense, we had the best fielding percentage in Major League Baseball this season. And then our pitching staff had the third most strikeouts as well. Moving things over to the league leaders around the league, starting things off with the National League side of things. The average leader was Brandon Nimmo of the New York Mets, followed by the hits leader was Freddie Freeman. The doubles leader was Trey Turner of the Cardinals with 49 two-baggers. He also had 15 triples, which led, this, led the league, and then 43 stolen bases as well. He is fast. 
Home run leader was Nolan Arenado and Freddie Freeman, both tied for 44, while Ian Happ hit 42 as well. The OPS leader was Otani, while Freeman and Nimmo all were in four digits as well, while the war leader is Brandon Nimmo with an 8.9. On the pitching side of things, I don't usually show wins, but Walker Buehler had 23 wins this season, so I felt like that was worth showing. The saves leader was Cody Hoyer with 62 for the Cubs. He also had 10 blown saves, so he could have easily had 72 saves if he just converted those. While the strikeout leader was Shohei Otani of the Cubs, the ERA leader was Walker Buehler as well as the innings pitched leader, and then he also led in war with 5.0, and then Otani right behind him with 4.9. On the American League side of things, their batting average leader was Andrew Benintendi of the Kansas City Royals with a 3-2-9. The hits leader was Isaiah Kiner-Falefa of the White Sox. Then you have the stolen base leader, Cedric Mullins of the Orioles. The home run leader was Matt Chapman with 48 on the season. The tra uh, OPS leader was Mike Tratt with a 10.52 OPS, and then also the highest war in the American League with a 9.5. On the pitching side of things, the wins leader is the Angels, or the Angels pitching rotation. That's the wins leader in the American League. The saves, rota uh, the saves leader was Liam Hendricks of the Astros. The ERA leader was Marco Gonzalez, the Gonzaga man of the Mariners. The innings pitched leader was Lucas Giolito of the Angels, as well as the strikeout leader, and had the highest war among pitchers in the American League. Well, if we take a look at the American League award winners, the MVP goes to Mike Trout, the Cy Young goes to Lucas Giolito, the Reliever of the Year goes to Liam Hendricks, the Rookie of the Year goes to Oswaldo, or Oswald Peraza of the New York Yankees, and then the Gold Glove catcher was at the Rushman, the Gold Glove first baseman was Ryan Mountcastle, another one for him, another Baltimore guy gets the shortstop in Gunnar Henderson, left field another Oriole in Austin Hayes, and then right field Jonathan Villar is the uh, Gold Glove winner for the Red Sox as well as the Silver Slugger at catcher is yet again Salvador Perez. On the National League side of things, it is Freddie Freeman winning the MVP. The Cy Young winner was Walker Bueller. The reliever of the year was Cody Hoyer. The rookie of the year was Brett Beatty of the Mets. The goal goal of catcher was Nick Fortes of the Marlins. The goal of first baseman was Matt Olson again. Second baseman was Gene Segura, dethroning Wong, and then the rest of the uh, Cardinals. And then uh, the shortstop was Dansby Swanson. Walls finished third in that race. The Gold Glove center fielder was Harrison Bader. And then at right field, it was Ronald Acuna Jr. While Brian Anderson finished third in right field race. So now if we take a look at the bracket here of the postseason, the St. Louis Cardinals beat the Chicago White Sox in five games to win the 2024 World Series. St. Louis went all the way from the wild card to go on and beat the White Sox in the World Series. Cubs got first rounded by the Phillies. The Dodgers got swept by the Cardinals coming out of the wild card round. Uh, Classic Angels got first rounded on the American League side of things. And then if we take a look at the award winners, the postseason MVP in the National League was Nolan Arenado. The American League was Aaron Judge of the White Sox. And then the World Series MVP was also Nolan Arenado. And then a little bit of an update on the minor leagues. The Chattanooga Lookouts, our AA team here in Cincinnati, won the AA South Championship. But now before we move on to the offseason, we do have one thing to go over, and that is the retirement. So first up on the docket is Joey Votto. He actually did finally retire, spent a year with the Arizona Diamondbacks organization, did not play in the big leagues, though. So we'll just pretend like he retired after last year with us. Corey Kluber, believe he was an all-star in 2022 with Tampa Bay, and then he had two solid seasons in Kansas City after that. Justin Turner hasn't played in the bigs the past two seasons. He now retires. Uh, Brandon Crawford didn't play in the bigs this year. He retires. Charlie Blackman was traded to the Red Sox in 2022, had a bad year with them in 2023, and then did not play this season in 2024. Lorenzo Cain had a not great 2022, and then he was an end of bench guy with the Angels and the Braves the past two seasons while Yadier Molina finally hangs up the cleats, retiring about like seven, eight years too late because of course. 
Albert Pujols doing the same thing, and then also Miguel Cabrera retiring after two years of being in free agency. Well, the Hall of Fame, two guys did actually get inducted, one of them being Miguel Cabrera, who goes in with no team, and then noted Oriole legend Albert Pujols goes in to Hall of Fame. So now let's actually jump into the off-season portion of this video. The first thing is up is taking a look at the budget. As you can see, we don't really have too much money tied up in anybody. The most is uh, Jonathan India. He has three more years, including this upcoming season, at $5.1 million per. Definitely uh, not going to be looking good if he can't get his thing together and start hitting for us. While well, Brian Anderson, another guy, two more years of him at $9 million. Hopefully he can turn things around. And then there is one more year of Tyler Malley at $14.5 million because we signed him to a two-year deal he had last year, and now he has this upcoming season. So not a lot of money tied up at all on guys. Uh, we also have Tyler Stevenson, who only has this upcoming season, and then he's free agent eligible. We will try to bring him back. And then there is Hunter Green, who we do want to re-sign when his deal is up as well, but he still has, I believe, like two more years and then on the staff side of things, David Bell was indeed fired. We cannot hold on to him anymore. He cannot be the head of that collapse and continue being the manager. So he is fired and we're bringing on everybody's favorite guy, Mike Matheny, to be the head coach. Uh, not that coaches matter at all in this game. It's really just aesthetics and then a you know, slight ratings boost if you really care about that. They don't really matter much though. But now when you see pitching changes, it will be Mike Matheny making them in the games. But now let's get into actually making some moves with players here. So the guys we let walk this offseason, there are a lot of them. Keep in mind, uh, we're going to be letting a lot of guys who are on the Major League roster walk at least a decent amount. And then a lot of guys who are like AAA level players walk as well because we're trying to revamp our minor league system. Here. We're trying to get guys from AA up to AAA because they're ready for it. And then just bringing some other guys around the league. Now keep in mind, I could end up bringing some of these guys back if we take a look at the state of the free agent pool and then decide that we want some of these guys back, we could do that. But as of right now, these are guys who will not be getting brought back. So Major League names, John Means, Kevin Kiermeyer, Andrew Chafin, J.D. Martinez, and Austin Barnes will all not be getting brought back. The only one on that list is Lucas Sims. We re-signed him to a one-year $4.7 million deal. And then as far as the other guys goes, Paven Smith, Jake Bowers, Jake Fraley, Josh James, Tony Santian, Ronnie Dawson, Isaiah Gilliam, Mark Colesbury, Alejo Lopez, Tanner Tully, Kyle Funkhauser, Cade McClure, and Evan Mendoza are all not being brought back to our team this upcoming season. Like I said, if we decide to bring any of these guys back, we can do that later in free agency, but as of right now, it's looking like they're not going to come back. Just too many guys clogging up spots. We want to open up spots and have guys playing where we want them to play. And we don't have to deal with, you know, prospects getting uh, shoved down the depth chart and not really getting as much developing time as we want them to get. But as far as the re-sign phase goes, we offered Taylor Walls a three-year, $8.4 million contract that is $2.8 per mil $2 .8 per, basically exactly what he was asking for. I believe it was like $0.1 million below what he wanted, but he still had a very green interest. Basically would have just bought it as team control the three years he guys left. For whatever reason, he did not sign that. Even though it was offered to him the whole free agency, he did not sign it and just went to arbitration instead and signed for $1.7 million through that for one season. Matt Feiss is being brought back on a one-year deal. Probably going to be the backup catcher for us to start this season. Uh, Max Schrock is also being brought back for a one-year deal. He's 30 years old at this point, but I mean, after the ratings boost he got, I just can't not bring him back, at least for depth, at the very least. Angelo Castellano, the guy we got from Robbie Grossman at the deadline, trading him to Kansas City, we're bringing him back for a year as well. Kent Emanuel was very solid in AAA for us. We're going to bring him back as well, brought him back instead of Tanner Tully. Uh, Dylan Coleman, the guy who throws 100 miles an hour, might as well bring him back in the organization. And then TJ Antone is back on a 1.7 million through arbitration. Nick Senzel, 2.9 through arbitration. And then Mitch Keller, 2 million flat through arbitration. 
just can't give up on him. I just keep looking at his ratings. I keep looking at his ratings and his, and his B potential, and he's not 30 yet, and I'm like, this guy's still something. He's still, he could be good. And every time with these guys, I end up being proven wrong, but I still can't give up on him. I still can't look at guys like this and be like, uh, we got to get rid of him. But now moving into the juicy part of the offseason, free agency. So basically the plan this offseason is that we're not really trying to sign anybody. Not going to be too many signings other than like some filler stuff, some depth stuff throughout the organization. But we don't really want to go out and sign anybody who's going to block anybody because the plan for this year's big league team is we're just going to let the kids play. We're going to unleash those kids at the big league level. Guys like Austin Hendrick, Jay Allen, Johnny Fagan, these are guys that we want coming up and playing every day in the big leagues and seeing what they got. Might as well just unleash the young guys and see if they can continue developing in the bigs and hopefully continue playing well as well. I am fairly confident that they are developed enough to a point to where they will be able to uh, perform decently well and be able to hopefully, be us, uh, hopefully have us be a wildcard team this season at the very least. But with that being said, we did make one good signing here, and that is J.P. Crawford. We made a four-year, $70 million offer to him. That's $17.5 million per. He ended up signing it. He's going to be our second baseman. I understand that he's a shortstop, but he can play second, obviously. So he's going to play second for us. He's a little worse defensively than Taylor Walls is. So that's why I decided to move him to second and not Walls. And we're just going to really have elite defense throughout the infield at third, short, and second with De La Cruz, Walls, and Crawford. India is going to move to DH now that J.D. Martinez is no longer on the team. And if he does not hit as the DH, there's zero reason to have him in the lineup and he will be benched. But as far as J.P. Crawford goes, he has been insane the past, th the past three seasons in Seattle. He walks more than he strikes at. So that's just like you look at that and you're like, I need that guy on my team. His home runs have gone up every season as well. He hit 21 this past year in Seattle. Absolutely incredible ratings too. Contact through the charts, vision, discipline, and clutch through the charts. Uh, powers in like the 50s. Very good defender as we know. Has a little bit of speed to him. Not going to steal too many bags, but that's not why we're signing him anyways. And then what really matters is J.P. Crawford's got the coolness off the charts. I mean, just just absolutely an insanely cool player. Possibly the coolest guy in the big leagues. Not named Jazz Chisholm, I should say. But then a couple other signings we did make that we're going to go over here are Zach McKinstry, a one-year $800,000 deal for him. He's 29 years old. He's a guy that I've had my eye on. He hasn't played much the past three seasons. Started with the Dodgers, played this last year on Milwaukee's bench. He did have some okay numbers in 99 games in 2023 with the Dodgers, but at overall hasn't played much in the big leagues. Has some serious pop against right-handed pitching. He can play all over the field. 82 arm strength too. Little speed to him as well. Definitely a useful player to have. And then we also went out and got Gregory Soto, a left-handed reliever for one year at 700000 was what we originally offered him. But then a couple other teams came in and were like, hey, we want him. Our offer's better. So we said, no, no, no. So we bumped it up to 900000 and we ended up getting him at that, uh, that number. Hasn't pitched in the bigs the last two seasons. Wasn't great in 2022 either, but I did want to add a lefty to the mix. Probably going to start the year in AAA for us, but he could very well end up in the big leagues at some point if we decide to need another lefty in the pen. He's a hard thrower, throws extremely hard with the fastball, has a good sinker-slider combo too. And now as far as the Rule 5 draft and the 40-man roster, we did add quite a few guys this offseason to our 40-man since we lost so many guys from our 40-man, letting them walk. So we did make a few adds to that. First one being Ron Marinaccio is now on the 40-man. Kent Emanuel is now on the 40-man, as well as Landon Marceau, the LSU pitcher, and Peyton Battenfield, the Oklahoma State pitcher. Josh, oh, Jose Torres, not Josh Torres. Jose Torres, the shortstop, is also added because he was eligible for the Rule 5 draft, so we did not want to lose him. And then Alec Willis is a guy who was eligible, but we actually, we actually left him off the list. Luckily, he wasn't taken, but we decided not to add another 40-man quite yet. And then uh, also we brought back Jonas, or Jonas Cespedes' younger brother, who 
every time I look at his ratings, he's just another guy where I look at his ratings, I'm like, he's got good contact, good vision, he's a really good defender, got some speed. He could easily be a good player, but he's just, he never is, but I never learn. I always bring these guys back, so he could be a, a depth guy in the organization. Well, as far as the Rule 5 draft went, like I said, we didn't take anyone, nor did we lose anybody, but you'll see that Jack Leiter was actually the first pick to the Washington Nationals, my first thought when I saw that was, what are the Rangers doing? But then I actually looked at the numbers he's put up with the Rangers the past three seasons, and he has been bad. Not very good at all. 20-plus starts in all three seasons. Very bad numbers in all of those seasons. And now just for a quick roundup of the signings throughout the rest of the league here in free agency, some of the notable ones. So Brandon Woodruff leaving the Brewers, going to the Cleveland Guardians, while Corbin Burns also leaving the Brewers, going to the Toronto Blue Jays. So both of those guys are out of our division and out of our league. But Shane Bieber is now coming to the Milwaukee Brewers. They could have easily given that money to one of the other two, but instead they give it to Shane Bieber, who's now on the Brewers. And then Brandon Lau from the Tampa Bay Rays is going to be a member of the Brewers as well. While Milwaukee also loses Freddie Peralta in division to the St. Louis Cardinals, and then the Cardinals also add veteran left-hander Clayton Kershaw to their rotation, while the New York Mets make a couple adds, one of them being Johnny Lasagna to their bullpen. And they add two catchers because teams love doubling up on signings. So they get Francisco Mejia and Carson Kelly to their roster here. While on the Bronx side of things, Willie Adamas is added to their roster. So the Brewers lose him. While uh, the Miami Marlins made a huge splash. It was just like every time I saw a signing, it was like, wow, that's, that's big. So they go out and they get Giovanni Gallegos to be their closer. Obviously, very good closer. The, the Cardinals lose him. Then I sim a few days and it's boom. They get Pete Alonzo from the Mets. So he's back, back down in Florida now. And then sim a few more days, boom, they got Carlos Correa. So the Miami Marlins going to be a real threat this season with those three big names added to their team. And they were already a pretty solid roster. While Nick Anderson is leaving the Rays and going to the San Diego Padres, the Los Angeles Dodgers pick up Danny Jansen. The Angels get John's me John Means to add to their uh, team that is completely stacked. He never does anything. And then Alex Verdugo gets big money to go to the San Francisco Giants. And then Austin Meadows, last but not least, signs with the Minnesota Twins. But that will not wrap things up here for the moves that we are making here in the offseason. We actually made a couple trades this offseason. The first one being sending Justin Dunn and Reese Hines to the Seattle Mariners in return for Evan White. This is more of just kind of a swapping of two guys who aren't really being used sort of thing. So Justin Dunn goes back to Seattle. We weren't really going to use him. Reese Hines was just added to make the deal work because White had a little bit higher of value than uh, Dunn did. So we just kind of threw him a throwaway prospect guy we don't really care about. And then Evan White is a gold glove level first baseman. Has some pop in his bat against right-handed pitching, even though he's a weird guy where he hits righty but catches lefty. And he hasn't played much in the past three seasons, and he also is on a weird deal where he's on like the last year of a nearly $5 million uh, contract or $5 million per year contract. It was one of those deals that teams give to guys because they think they're going to be like the next thing, and then they don't pan out, so they end up being an overpaid prospect or like an overpaid quad A guy. Now, I don't really know if Evan White is going to be like an everyday first baseman for us or what his role is really going to be other than probably on the big league roster to start. We're just kind of adding an option to have on the team here. And if he doesn't work out, then we let him walk at the end of the season, just like we would have done with Justin Dunn, and it's no harm, no foul. But then the other trade we did was a pretty big one. Tony Gonsolin is going to be coming over to the Cincinnati Reds from the Los Angeles Dodgers, while the Dodgers get Nick Senzel and Matt McClain. So with this trade, we are solidifying the one through four spots in our starting rotation, while the fifth spot is still up for grabs from any young guy who can really solidify that and just say that he wants that spot, rather than just a bunch of guys who come up and throw eight starts and get absolutely shelled like it was last season. Nick Senzel could have been our everyday center fielder this year, but I wanted to open up that spot for Jay Allen to let him be the young guy who plays there every day. And then also he could have been the bench guy like he usually was, but I wanted Zach McKinstry to be the main bench utility guy for us. 
Senzel still has one more year of team control. He's going to go to the Dodgers for those, uh, those the rest of his team control there. And then also Matt McClain. He's a UCLA guy. He goes back to LA. He's now one of their two best shortstops on the roster, so maybe they can get something out of him. And then Tony Gonsolin has this year and another year of team control as well. He should definitely help our pitching staff. Like I said, I really want to solidify one, to th one through four and then just have that fifth spot be whatever young guy wants it at least for now. So now if we take a look at what our roster is going to look like here in Season 4, the 2025 campaign, the MLB roster as it's scrolling by, I do think we have a pretty good roster. But with how things have gone in this series, who knows what this team is going to do. I think we have a good mix of legit players and promising young guys, guys who can come up in their first years and just do, just be good enough to really help us uh, be a good team and even maybe even be better than just good enough. So if we can just really avoid a just disaster collapse like last season, the wild card is very doable with this roster, I believe. So we'll just take a look at the uh, the actual rotations and whatnot. So the rotation one to five to start the year is going to be Hunter Green, Tyler Malley, Lodolo there at the three to split up the lefties. And then Gonsolin at four, and then five will be Williamson. Well, on the bullpen, Lucas Sims is the closer, while TJ Antone and Alex Reyes are the setup guys. And then Ryan Weathers, DeAndre Foster, Seth Elledge, and Ron Marinaccio, who had a great year in the minors last year and is now being rewarded with a spot in the big league route in the big league bullpen. And then on the hitting side of things, the lineup against righties is leading off at second base, J.P. Crawford. The D.H. is Jonathan India. That's the two-hole, the spot he was in during his best years for us, so we're going to put him back there. Tyler Stevenson now hitting third and catching. Johnny Fagan is the cleanup guy. We don't really have a power threat on this team. That's the one thing we're kind of missing, but it's also not really what we're trying to build here anyways. So think of Johnny Fagan as a guy like Ty France in that cleanup spot. I don't know if they really actually hit him cleanup in real life, but think of him as like a player like that. He's going to, you know, hit a lot of doubles, drive in a lot of guys, but he's not going to hit 40 home runs. While Ellie De La Cruz is hitting fifth and batting third, and then Austin Hendrick in right, Joe Adele in left, Taylor Walls in eighth playing shortstop. He was fantastic in the bottom half of the order last season, and then he was not so great leading off. It just seemed like that decline happened like right then. It could have just been because everybody was sucking at that point, but we're just going to start him off in that eighth spot. And then rounding things out will be the rookie center fielder, Jay Allen. The lineup against lefties is basically the same exact thing, except Joe Adele and Austin Hendrick flip spots. And then on the bench, it's McKinstry, who is the main utility guy. He can play shortstop. That's why he's on the Major League roster instead of Schrock, who cannot play shortstop. And then Brian Anderson, also utility guy, going to be getting some time there. And then Matt Theis, backup catcher. Evan White, backup first baseman slash pinch hitter, possible late inning defensive replacement guy at first for Johnny Fagan as well. And then also Adrian Merced is the fourth outfielder, the only guy on this bench who can play center field. And then last but not least, the new numbers on the team. So Tony Gonsolin is wearing number 26 here with the Reds, while Zach McKinstry wearing 28. He's worn eight his basically whole career, and eight is retired here in Cincinnati, so he's wearing uh, 28 because it's just add a number to eight. J.P. Crawford continuing to wear number three like he did in Seattle. Jay Allen is not wearing 69 for us. We're actually giving him the cool number zero. And then Austin Hendricks going to wear number two out in right field. Johnny Fagan's wearing 44. Evan White is wearing 12. And then Ron Marinaccio is wearing 97 like he does for the Yankees in real life. So that will wrap things up here for this edition of the Cincinnati Reds franchise, the off-season edition as we get ready to embark here on Season 4, the 2025 campaign, the postseason, we want it, baby. J.P. Crawford and the boys are here to take it. So I've been your host, Jerseyborn, and I am saying, Max Holloway. Max Holloway.